Yeah, I'll do that. Well, it's good to be on the campus of Clear Creek Baptist Bible College. Amen. I'm telling you, it looks like December in October. So uh, praise the Lord. Hope you dressed warm, brought a coat, extra layers. And uh, how about that snow this morning? God's good. Well, we want to pray together. We'll save the introduction of our speaker for a little bit later. Dr. Nix will do that at the end of our time of worship. But uh, we want to kick things off with prayer. We do remind you that uh, we are in the final days of collecting the Eliza Broad Estate Missions Offering. If memory serves me correct, about 248-ish in there is our goal or is what we're lacking in reaching our goal. And so I think the challenge that uh, Student Life put out to us is if everybody could prayerfully give a $10 gift, then we'll reach that goal, exceed that goal uh, by the deadline. So appreciate uh, the generosity of those who've given so far, and uh, we look forward to seeing what God's going to do there. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for all the students, faculty, and staff who are gathered together on this campus, Father, as we just seek to be in your will or doing what you desire of us. We pray, Father, that you would bless in our time together, Lord, through the worship of your name and song and the preaching of your word. Bless your preacher today, Father. I pray that you'd strengthen him for the task that is before him, Father. May you be honored and glorified in every way. Way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, Clear Creek. Let's stand together and worship our Savior. How firm a foundation, you saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he has said, to you who for refuge to Jesus has fled? Fear not, he is with us, oh, be not dismayed, for he is our God, our sustainer and strength. He'll be our defender and cause us to stand, upheld by his merciful, almighty hand. And how firm our foundation soul that is trusting in Jesus as Lord will press on enduring the darkest of storms and though even hell should endeavor to shake he'll never, no never, no never forsake he'll never, no never, no never forsake
the Lord praise, church. Now we're going to enter into our time of uh, prayer and worship, and I just pray right now that all of you, whether sitting, standing, or come to this altar, will go to the Lord knowing that we can go boldly before his throne through the blood of Christ. So join me as we pray.
Most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I come to you, and Lord, just singing the praise the name of Jesus Christ, our Lamb of God, slain before the foundations of the earth. God, I pray we don't just flippantly sing through these songs that we've sung here at Clear Creek time and time again, but that we truly mean what we're singing, Lord, and we embrace, Lord, the love that you gave us, Lord, that we did not deserve. And God, we deserve justice and wrath, but you gave us mercy and grace. And all we can say is thank you, Lord Jesus. And so, God, now as we enter into this time of worship through your word, let us be focused on you and focus on what you would have to tell us and give you all the glory and honor for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, at this point is usually when you'd see me sneak off, but uh, Brian has asked me to uh, do have the honor of introducing him for his senior chapel. And uh, so, uh, for you guys that don't know Brian Sersall, there's one thing that I think we all know about Brian Sersall. He is well studied. He knows what he knows. He loves talking about the things that God has taught through the Word. And it just comes over in the joy in the classroom of being able to tell us um, more and more about how God has inspired you, brother, through His Word. And it's been honored to have you in my classes. I know the other professors as well feel the same way. And before you come up here, let me pray over you. And it's just such an honor to be able to share this day with you. Let's pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for my brother Brian, Lord, and him coming to this achievement, Lord, of his senior chapel. God, I know that throughout the years, Lord, uh, you've blessed him with the heart of study. Lord, the one that wants to continue to dive deeper and deeper into your word to fully understand as much as possible, knowing that he'll never reach the bottom. God, and what a beautiful mystery it is, Lord, when we think about your word. And Lord, I think about Brian and Lord... Every time I think of the times I was having to study for class and study for dissertations and all of that, Lord, it felt like drudgery. But every time I look at Brian and see him studying, whether it be something musical, theological, or anything in between, where there's a sense of joy there, of excitement to share what you've been teaching him. And so, God, I pray this morning for your spirit to be upon him. And, Lord, now speak through him. Lord, to help it not be Brian standing here, but you, Lord, speaking to us through the word that you have blessed him with in his uh, devotional times this week. And, God, I just thank you again for all that Brian means to me and how much more I know he means to you. And we ask you to bless him this morning as he brings the word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Make sure the mic is on. Everything, everything all good. All right. Got the thumbs up back there in IT, which means that things are functioning properly. Uh, let's begin with some thank yous. Uh, first of all, the most important figure in my life who I want to thank is the Lord, who has brought me this far, who has taught me so much, who has given me so much that I do not deserve. He is faithful to me, even when I'm unfaithful to Him. And it's amazing how forgiving and loving he is. So I want to thank him. Next, I want to thank my wife out there in the back. Um, she's been my encourager, encourager all through my time here since we met. I want to thank my family, um, both my family and her um, family, for all of the times that we spent that are important to me. Uh, helping me as I go through life. I want to thank the staff and faculty here for all the things you have taught me, which you all have taught me a lot. There's oh so much I've learned from you. And not just by what you say, but what you do. Um, thank you for all of that and keep running that race. And I also want to thank the people who have given to this institution, who provide scholarships that's helped me <laughs> get, come along. Um, I want to thank those individuals. I want to thank uh, my friends who I met here. Um, I, I'm always going to remember my first two semesters when it was, I believe it was me, you had Alex, you had Ben, Caleb, who's back there in the booth. We would go walking around campus a lot of times at night, I'd be walking around campus singing, I saw the light. And I'm always going to remember fondly those walks. So the passage I'm going to be, that I want us to turn to, is in Matthew chapter 4. It's going to be from verses 18 to 22. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon, called Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, 
for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. And going on from thence, he saw two other brethren, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, in a ship with Zebedee their father, mending their nets. And he called them. And they immediately left the ship and their father and followed him. Lord, I ask and pray that you would help me here. Um, I have a lot of nerves. There's a lot of emotions raging through my, through my mind right now. But Lord, I ask and pray that I would just focus on presenting your word and the subject matter which you've challenged me with. I ask and pray that you continue to grow me in this area as it is with everyone here in this room. So here, within these verses, Matthew 4, 18-22, you see the beginning of this beautiful journey that Peter, Andrew, James, and John are about to go on. As they're going about their life, um, they're fishers by trade, they see Jesus walking down towards them. He says, come follow me, and they follow and at that point, their life was completely changed. And for many of us here, actually, I would hope it's for all, but I say many just in case, but for hopefully all of us here, we all can as well remember that initial point when Jesus came into our lives and said, come follow me. And ever since that day, our lives have been changed. And what Jesus has called us to is to be a disciple. Turn with me to Matthew 28, uh, 19 through 20, though many of you can quote this by memory. Um, it's the Great Commission. So here, let's uh, turn to that. Well, I can just say it outright. Oh, the font's kind of small, but it'll be fine. So Jesus says unto his disciples, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So right here, within the Great Commission, you have discipleship. He calls them to be a disciple. The King James Version, which you have up there, says teaching. But the Greek word that's, that's used, and I'm pulling directly from within the passage, is methetousate. Uh, Sorry if I kind of rushed the pronunciation there. But it conveys the idea, it, the word is used to indicate the action of causing another to become a disciple. And the passive forms indicate being or becoming a disciple. So one thing that I think the church must remember, because I've been in situations where this was forgotten, discipleship is not the aftermath of the Great Commission, it is the Great Commission. There are also many times where we only focus on that first step, the first part of the discipleship journey, where you tell them about their need for Christ, you share the gospel with them. But Jesus is calling for more than just that. He doesn't want us to just go and introduce, but that's obviously part of it. He wants us to disciple them, to make disciples, to, to cause them to run after Him, pursue Him. You know, He says, teaching my statues and ornaments, teaching my words. And I think that's something that we need to take to heart, not just as a church, but individually. Who are we discipling? And who, <laughs> what is our status as a disciple of Christ? Are we following Him? Are we not following Him? Are we being a disciple? That is important to remember. Jesus prioritizes discipleship. And that should be the case within the church and within our lives. The gospel doesn't end at that initial point. The gospel informs the entirety of our life. That is important to remember. So because discipleship is so important, let's examine it in detail. What does it mean to be a disciple? Being a disciple involves more than mentally agreeing with someone or being influenced by someone, being a disciple involves devoting oneself to a person and his teaching. 
So, when, when we approach discipleship, when we think about discipleship within our own lives and when we're teaching others, discipling others, the goal is not merely for people to, to be able to regurgitate Bible facts. The goal is for the Word, which encompasses the whole of Scripture, to be applied into the life. It's, it's, the goal is for it to be lived. Uh, and beyond that, a disciple doesn't just study what the teacher says. He or she seeks to emulate the teacher. You see, there are people I can study, like you can study a philosopher, you can study uh, a historical figure and agree with things that they say, but that's not the same as being a disciple, where what they say informs every part of your life. It captures your very being. There is a difference. It is possible for you to be influenced by Jesus, but not a disciple of Jesus. That's a very important distinction. But let's deal, while well, well, you know, now that I mentioned the importance of discipleship, let's deal with some hindrances that come up to being a disciple of Jesus. First one that I am going to mention is the love of money. Let's turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. Probably should have put some footnotes here so I don't have to turn alongside and just get straight to it but first Timothy chapter 6 verse 10 it says for the love of money is the root of all evil which while some have coveted after they have er erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows there are many 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 examples within just the gospels alone of people refusing to follow Jesus due to the love of money. An obvious example would be the rich young ruler who he came to Jesus, um, acknowledged him as a teacher, he wanted to be a disciple. And Jesus, <laughs> he really has a knack of getting right to the heart of things. He tells this man, all right, sell all that you have and come follow me. Notice, follow me. Jesus is inviting him to be a disciple. But the man leaves weeping because he has many possessions. I am convinced that many people try to stifle what God is commanding them to do because the, the very thought of going from an established financial situation to a place of unrest, they just cannot accept it. They can't give up what they have. And, I, I mean, we, we focus a lot on making sure our needs are taken care of. Uh, but sometimes, especially within this culture, the thought of I am being paid this much now, but if I go to this place, which God says I'm going to go to, I'm going to be paid less. My needs are going to be covered, but I'll be paid less. We still reject it because we take to heart the notion that I deserve more and more and more and more. That's our culture. And that's not to say that God won't ever call you to a higher paid position. I'm not saying that. I just don't want you to reject what God says because I deserve more. That's the love of money speaking. And let's deal with uh, an issue that I've encountered many uh, critics of Christianity mention, um, the must-provide problem. Uh, let's go to 1 Timothy uh, chapter 5, verse 8. But if any does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Now, the skeptic, looking at this passage, will say, well, what about Jesus and the disciples? You literally have an instance, which I just read here at the opening, where these sons abandoned their father to follow Jesus. They weren't providing for their family. They were relying upon the giving of others. Same for Jesus. Jesus, he spent his years as a carpenter, but then he leaves. You know, who's taking care of his mother? 
You see, that's that's the tension that critics will mention. So, uh, it is G, did Jesus deny the faith by leaving, not making money, relying upon the giving of, of others? Well, no, this is not a problem. Look at the context. Look at the, what was the purpose of 1 Timothy 5, 8. What are in the, in the passages around it? And I think that looking at the passages around it, you'll realize it's dealing with a status of the heart. It's not, it's not saying if you put yourself in a situation where you have less, you're a failure as a believer. Looking in, in the surrounding verses, so let's look at from 4 to 7 of chapter 5. So, But if any widow have children or nephews, let them learn first to shew piety at home and to requite their parents, for that is good and acceptable before God. Now she that is a widow indeed and desolate trusteth in God and continueth in supplications and prayers night and day. But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. And these things give in charge, that they may be blameless. And then you got the verse, But if any does not provide for his own, especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith, and is worse than an infidel. Verse 9, Let not a widow be taken into the number under threescore years old, having been the wife of one man. And so on and so forth. So what he is dealing with here is the question of character. So, if any does not provide for his own house, uh, I was reading through a few commentaries, and a number of commentators suggest that this is referring to people who were in the church that were refusing to take care of their parents, their widow. You know, their mother's husband passed away. She has nothing within the society. They refuse to take care of her. And later on, in other places, it deals with um, whether widows should be on the roll and those who go run around, do nothing, they're busybodies. And by busybodies, I don't mean busybodies about work. They're busybodies about going to find other, going from house to house, essentially gossiping and things of that nature. That's all they do. Jesus is dealing, well, well, Jesus obviously um, has a role in influencing what Paul is thinking here, but specifically the Holy Spirit uh, is inspiring Paul to deal with a status of the heart. And this, is, and this is the point I want to make. God is, in fact, opposed to an unwillingness to provide for one's family. However, we must not reject the work which He has called us to do because of our idea about what providing means. We are not not working. We are doing His work. It is important to remember that. I can almost guarantee you will encounter situations in your own life or from people talking to you where they will mention, well, you need to provide for your family. And usually what they mean by provide is a little more than what Jesus would define provide as. You know, roof over your head, food for the day, clothing. We tend to mean those things and a whole bunch of these extra things. And we tend to insert that into the definition. You are not a provider if you don't give your family a nice home. You're not a provider if you don't have a nice car. You're not a provider if you don't give your kids these opportunities. And sometimes in pursuing to be this idea of the provider, you neglect some important things the Scripture says you need to do. There are some times where you have, for example, the father who is never home because there's always, they're always working, and even when they are home, they're still in that work state. You are neglecting the command within the Scripture to disciple your child, to pour into your child, to be with your child, to teach your child. You cannot do that if your whole life is devoted to nothing but working to get more things. Do not neglect the work that God has called you to do due to the pursuit of money. Jesus says in Matthew 6, 24-34, which is really dealing with the issue of money, No man can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. 
And now here, it's interesting. He begins by saying you cannot, you know, love, you know, fall into the love of money. And then he deals with the concerns that come about because of money. Because really, love of money is a love of security. Because we think that money provides us with security. But he, he deals with this. He says, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought of your life, what ye shall eat, what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not life more than meat, and the body more than raiment? Behold, the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not but much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit to his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, and they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon, in all of his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the, field, the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all. Now, do not misinterpret what I'm saying here, or what Jesus is saying here. It does not mean don't work to take care of your family. It means you need to do the Lord's work. You need to not let money take the place of God as your sole provider. Don't rely upon money as the answer to everything, because it is not. Christ says this, and He lived it. He did not have much. I mean, He Himself says um, <laughs> they, that, you know, foxes, you know, birds, they have places to rest. But what of me? I have nowhere to rest my head. But yet, he was doing the Lord's work. So, do not become <laughs> busybodies about doing work to attain things. Become a busybody about doing the Lord's work. And trust in His provision. And that ties into the next hindrance, which is the love of security. Which we've pretty much already covered here. Uh, a lot of the motivation as to why... We want money it's because we think it provides security. And then Luke 12, 16 to 31, and for time's sake, I won't um, read through the passage. I'll uh, summarize it. Um, but you have here an instance of a, of a man. He builds multiple barns, and he, he says, All right, uh, I'm just going to build these few more, and then at last my soul can have rest. But then Jesus has these great words, You fool! For on this very night, your soul is required of you. You see, we can look to our storehouses, our barns, and think that that's what's going to get us through absolutely everything. And again, that's not to say, I mean, multiple times in the Proverbs, you have examples of saving, being a good steward, etc. Just don't let your faith be in that. Let your faith be in God. Let Him be your security. Because at this moment, and this man meet, met his end, what, what did all of his money do for him? Nothing. There are people who have so much money in the world today that they have no reason to ever need to worry about anything. But are they, do they feel secure? Do they feel safe? Do they feel established? No. Hence why they always got to keep saving up more and more. It can be an endless cycle. If I have just this, this bit more, I'll be okay. No. You are okay when you are doing what the Lord says you are to do. And then another hindrance to being disciples is unwillingness to sacrifice. Uh, verse uh, uh, 27 here. Um, and whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me, cannot be my disciple. This is another area where people have an unwillingness. They aren't willing to give up things to follow Jesus. I mean, I'm willing to agree that Jesus was right about these things. I'm willing to agree with these assertions, but I, I can't give this up. 
this is too important to me. Which, by saying that that's too important to me, that becomes your God. Christ is no longer God at that point. But there is a real struggle to sacrifice. I mean, martyrdom, you're talking about the extreme example of sacrifice, it's, we tend to get in our minds this picture, this kind of romanticized version of, you know, where before the tribunal, do you deny Christ? I do not de deny Christ, and then you die, but you don't really think about the circumstances of your death, and hoorah, I went through. No, the re reality is that at martyrdom, you are facing the final, final bout of faith, because you face death, you face the unknown, which you have faith that there is an afterlife after this, but you have not seen it, so it is faith. You're believing in that which you have not seen. And you're more than that, you're sacrificing your life, which you could have lived. You could have lived beyond this point of martyrdom, but you're giving it up. I mean, just think of the instance with Stephen, where they stoned him. A lot of us can remember... Uh, as kids, when someone grabbed a ball or something and threw it in and hit us in the face, and some of us cried, some of us wanted to swipe back with our fists, uh, we respond with anger. Uh, that might be how a lot of us would respond if we were put in that serious situation. But notice that Stephen didn't respond that way, and I think that's very interesting. He's following in Christ's footsteps of doing that, because Christ obviously did not resist. He accepted his murder. And that's, that can be hard. But Stephen did the same. He has the vision. He sees the Lord. And he tells the Lord, Father, hold not the sin against them. Now, referring back to, you know, if you were to get hit, your response with it is anger. How do you reach this point where your response to violence, your response to oppression is love. That's not a natural response. And that's not to say it is wrong to say, this is wrong, this is evil. I mean, he himself in saying that was saying what they were doing is evil, but he loved them and said, Lord, please uh, hold not this sin against them. I, I want to look at a very interesting passage, Revelation chapter 6. I'm going to look at verses 9 through 11. So let's turn there. It's very interesting. Let's see, I can get the pages. Okay. So, verse 9. Of course, my Bible ends up on the wrong page. All right. Okay, I got like a page that's stuck in between here. I know it's in, oh, there we go. Now it finally flipped. You know when you're trying to turn a Bible and two pages get stuck and you're trying to figure out how to get it open up, right? Yeah. So verse 9, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season, until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. So you see here, you know, they respond to this evil asking for God's just, justice. That is appropriate. We have many examples of that within the Psalms. You can respond to persecution in that way in addressing God. But notice God, the answer that they are given, the answer that God gives them. He gives them a white robe, tells them to rest, and wait till the rest of their number are slain. That means that God has a plan for these other brethren will die too. You see, I don't know if there will be anyone here in this room, maybe, but for some of you, you have a date coming that the Lord has set. Well, you will sacrifice your life for His sake, according to His plan. I mean, Christ Himself 
is the prime example of that where he f obeyed the Father unto death. I mean, it, it's not to remove human responsibility. I mean, just look in uh, Acts when you have Peter's servant, when he's speaking to them, he says, you know, that they did this evil, but this was God, God's plan. Now, not everyone here is going to face martyrdom, but you might face a kind of martyrdom when it comes to sacrificing certain things that you hold dear in your life. Some things you might give up for the sake of following Him. You might love living in a certain area. You might love having these things. And not to say that the love, you know, not to say that things are bad, but when they take the place of God, that's when they become very wrong. So, you, you got to, the call of discipleship involves a complete giving over, complete giving over to Christ. Don't let anything get in the way of that. And then fin finally, the final hindrance I'll mention here is the belief, we're believing that I'm a disciple of Jesus, but the reality is that I'm a disciple of something or someone else. That is a big hindrance for many people because they get delusioned. They, they think, I'm a disciple of Jesus, when in fact you're not. You follow, like, if you were to compare, if, if Christ were to stand up and, and, and compare, you know, who you give your attention to, who you love, who you follow, and you were to compare what He says to what this other person or thing says, there are many people who would fall completely deficient. And there are many times in our lives when we fall deficient. And there's a really good story from church history that illustrates this. A Saint Jerome, a figure who uh, translated the Bible into what we know as the Latin Vulgate, so that the people of the time could be able to read uh, the Scripture. So there's an incident where he got sick, and I'm going to read uh, a dream that he had. Th this dream completely convicted him. He says, Suddenly I was caught up in the Spirit, and dragged before the judgment seat of the judge. And here the light was so bright, and those who stood around were so radiant, that I cast myself upon the ground, and did not dare to look up. As who I was, and what, I, what was I, I replied, I am a Christian. But he who presided said, Thou liest. Thou art a follower of Cicero, not of Christ. For where thy treasure is, thy heart will be also. There are many good people that we follow. They say things that correspond with Scripture. They're great. But it's possible to be more of a disciple of them than you are of Christ. So make sure, if you haven't read the Gospels in a while, revisit them. Look carefully through His words and apply them to your life. Make sure you're a disciple of Him and not of someone else. And also remember that it was Jesus Himself who called you. And really your whole life is summed up in those words, follow me. That encompasses everything from your beginning to your end. I mean, Jesus took the initiative to speak to you. He loves you. So, give yourself to Him. And I'm going to conclude here. I actually wrote a song. Um, still working on the music side of things, so I'm going to read this. <laughs> still working on, on the melody, but I wrote a song that was inspired by the material that we're dealing here. I called it Follow Me. And the song says, actually I might be able to sing it. At the moment of my second birth, I heard the sweetest words. They were, you are mine. Now come and follow me. Those were the words of Jesus Christ, the one who gave me a second life. Oh, wonderful days those truly were when I was young and loved him so. I remember the bountiful joy that possessed my every thought as I learned about the Master and desired to obey his word. The road was rough, but I hardly cared because my eyes, they were fixed upon the Lord. Oh, how different it would have been if my focus had remained sure. But at last, my eyes were diverted 
to the road. The road before me seemed impossible, and my body ached and groaned. My eyes turned from his footsteps to the paths beside the road. The paths looked gentler and certainly prettier, and the destination seemed sublime. I chose a path to walk down and abandoned Jesus Christ. The paths were easy and provided some pleasures, but as the years went by, the paths, they lost their beauty. I felt emptiness inside. I've lost my way and I cannot find the road. I don't deserve to find it anyway because I've deserted the Lord. Lord, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Save my unfaithful soul. Woe am I. Now I'm enslaved to regret for life. As I lay there weeping, I heard footsteps approaching. I tried to wipe away my tears, but they were unceasing. I looked up and I saw a sight that meant more to me than life. I saw the Lord standing right there before me. He looked at me with eyes filled with love and said, you are mine, my beloved. I will never abandon you. Now come and follow me. And Lord, I ask and pray that we would take this dear to heart. Lord, please forgive us for all the times that we have diverted on different paths and abandoned you. But Lord, though we are unfaithful, you are faithful. Thank you for your forgiveness. Lord, please correct us in any areas that are wrong. Please forgive me for my sin. And Lord, please forgive, you know, bring others to you. To mind, and bring to mind their sins that they would repent too, that they would get on the right track and follow you. Lord, let us never forget that our whole life is bound up in following you. And let us love you and never lose sight of you. Thank you for this time, and Lord, I ask and pray that the Spirit continue to use the words of this message in my life first, that I would keep correcting and guiding me, and may the same be for everyone else here in the room. Thank you for all that you have done and all that you will do, and for your ceaseless love. In Christ's name I pray, amen.